tonight. Boy, do I have a powerful study for you. Grab your devices, grab your Bible, grab whatever you use to follow me in the Word of God. Because tonight we're going to talk about some very important, practical things that you can add to your life. You know we're still talking about faith, but tonight I'm going to be dealing with two passages of Scripture that start off in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, but take us back to the book of Genesis. So, before we get started, make sure you now share this uh, Bible study. Go out and call someone, let them know that we're on right now. They don't want to miss this installation, this part of this message on putting your faith into action. We are living in a time right now where you better know that your faith works. That's right. I'm talking about faulty faith is not going to get it. Does your faith work? If there's anybody in the room with you, ask them that question. Does your faith work? Because the reality is you're living in one of the most critical, crucial times, I believe, prophetically, and we need our faith just to make it day to day. So, we, I, I, I talked about this before. I'm talking about faith because as long as I've been preaching, as long as I've been ministering, as long as I've been a child of God, I will tell you, I understand why Paul says, I die daily. I die to this nature, this sin nature within me. It has this propensity to sin. I die to the urges of my weaknesses and my failures. I die to those things that keep making me fail and constantly fall. And I try to die to that stuff. And the only way you can walk sometimes is by faith. So appropriately, this lesson is entitled, Putting Your Faith Into Action. I don't want to go back, but I want to tell you, you have enough faith, and nobody ever told you that. I want to share that with you. That's right. I don't care what kind of fear you're experiencing. I don't care what's going on in the world. God has programmed enough faith in you to handle anything. You ought to applaud right there. You ought to praise God right there. You ought to let some exhale, let some fear go right now, because God has given you enough faith to go through anything. Somebody ought to say, I can handle it. Come on, say it with me. I can handle it. It is not shocking. And so we're in the book of Genesis. Although we're in the book of Hebrews, it ties back to Genesis because in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, which we know is the hall of faith or the hall of fame of faith, uh, there's a scripture in Romans 15 and 4 that tells us these things were written aforetime for our learning so that we would always have hope. Romans 15, 4. These things were written. So even though the book of Genesis is, you know, the beginning, it also is prophetic in the unfolding of things that happen through God's chosen People, you and I are powerful tonight. You're powerful tonight. I'm speaking into your spirit. You are mighty tonight. You can handle it tonight. You're an overcomer tonight. And all you have to do is learn how to release or put your faith into action. I guess the scariest thing I'm saying is you have to put your faith into action. And I don't care how big your church, I don't care how many times you go to Bible study or other places, the moments in life, the moments, it comes down to the moments when you're in a trial, can you handle it? Somebody may be having one of those moments right now, but that's what it comes down to. And in your moments, you ought to know God is rooting for you, all the heaven is rooting for you, and you are already a winner. So let's go, let's go there. Before I drop my phone, let's move on. So let's pray. we got to pray for us. Father God, it is with anticipated excitement. It is with a joy, a phenomenal, consistent joy that we go back into our Bibles, into our Word. What a protection. What a, what a covering. What a sense, what a place of peace. I got your Word that you spoke down so that I could have victory in every sense of the Word. In every sense of my life, I will have victory because of the power in your word. You told us to study your word, study to show ourselves approved. Study your word, and your word would guide us. 
Let someone know how important this study is tonight. They just need to release that mustard seed of faith. And whatever they are seeking, whatever they are dealing with, whatever they are going through, they will get the victory over it. So I thank you and praise you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. We started out this teaching, I think it's maybe the fifth installment, and now we've come to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, where we're actually looking at the weaknesses and the strength of God's people and how they were able to stand in faith when they came to their moment. Somebody say, this is my moment. You will stand in that moment if you learn how to release your faith. I wish I could tell you it's easy. It's not easy. It's never going to be easy to stand by faith. You have to learn what I need to do to make faith work. So we talked about that, and we looked a little bit at Abel. we got to finish up that when we go to Hebrews um, chapter 11, after going through the introductory remarks, establishing a definition of faith, how faith came to be, we now find ourselves at that fifth verse where God now is using um, the, when you start the sentence out, it's going to always say, by faith, so-and-so did. By faith, so-and-so did. That is you and me. If you're going to look back and tell me how you got through your last trial, if you be honest, you'll say, by faith. I know there's somebody out there other than me that know it was just holding on to my faith that got me through my critical time. But when God shows us these words, here's what you need to know. There are stories that unfold, and don't take them as, you know, some little light Bible story that we learned in Sunday school. we got to look behind the scenes and watch the emotions that they had to deal with, the feelings they had to deal with, the, uh, the context of, of, of the trial. we got to look at their surrounding, what was going on in their world when this was happening. All of this makes a difference. And so we're going to look at that because even though those stories are nice, or we know the stories, they're familiar. The one thing you need to understand is there are principles that you can stand on. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to show you some principles from these characters that you can apply to your faith that will help you be what God wants you to be. So let's look at it. Verse 4. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain. By faith, he was commended as Righteous. Watch the words. When God spoke well of his offerings and by faith. Somebody say it with me. By faith. Trying to get you to grab onto that. Abel still speaks even though he is dead. So, the character that God introduces first is the second born of Adam and Eve who is Abel. Who we look at Abel as being a good guy. But let's look at the total surrounding by going to Genesis chapter 4. Let's go to Genesis. When you get to Genesis chapter 4, we're going to see some interesting things. You're going to see right after chapter 4. You're going to see right after the, the Bible transition is right after God pronounced the curse and said the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent would be fighting. You know that's talking about that right after Adam and Eve got put out of the garden... Right? We know now we have fallen into sin. The whole world has fallen into sin. They now have this sin nature they have to fight. Where comes into the world our spiritual warfare? Spiritual warfare does not come because there's a lot of demons running around just trying to attack us. That's only part of it. Spiritual warfare comes because of our nature. Because of who we are in God. Because of the things that we have to fight through. Everybody. Everybody here, if you be honest, there's something going on in your life that you know you need to strengthen or you'll go through that same problem over and over and over again. But in Genesis chapter 4, let's read. I want to take you through so we get a good foundation of what the story is saying. Then we can understand what's happening with Abel. You have it? Genesis 4. I'm reading from the NIV. Adam, verse 1, made love to his wife Eve. And she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. 
Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of his fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain, verse 5, and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, this means he didn't rule over the sin, let's go out to the field. While they were there in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said to Cain, what? have you done? In this chapter, we find the unfolding of several things. We find the first conception and birth. We find the first people born. We find the sons of Adam and Eve that came forth. Um, we find out that there are uh, different professions. You know, you know, we look at the world and think how this stuff come to be. But there was one farmer and there was one who was um, also, we look at toiling the land and planting. Also, somebody who was out there taking care of the sheep. He was a shepherd. And so we see all of these things happen. And then we watch how the enemy has begun to work by having the first murder happen in a family. Did you ever think about the significance of that? That this murder that took place, this first showing of evil after Adam and Eve, you know, had got kicked out the garden and the Satan had deceived them and God had saw the fall of man and told them that they would have to live through this part of sin, fighting their whole life. And, you know, while we watch the plan of redemption coming to pass, but think about it, now all of a sudden the enemy is putting into play his evil to come to pass. I need you to know, at the conception of every good thing in your life, you need some spiritual antennas, you need some discernment to know the devil's just not going to let you sit back and have his victory. You ought to realize while you're running around all happy and laughing and smiling, you better know there's a battle going on. You better know there's some fighting I got to do. Every morning when you get up, that's why God gave us the whole symbolism spiritually of putting on the armor of God. If you're sitting there now and some thoughts are seeping through your mind, you know, the mind, our mind is that battlefield. Our mind is where we use as our weapon. Our mind is where the enemy has to attack to make us weak. If there's no word in your mind, you can't build faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If there's no word in your mind, you can't build up the resistance and the faith to handle this. So just reading about this spiritual warfare of Adam and Eve, of Cain and Abel, lets you know how tricky the enemy is working. He's always got a plan to do the unspeakable. Oh, that was good. I got to say it again. The devil wants to do the unspeakable. He's not trying to do a little sin. He's not trying to make you have a small problem. He's going in trying to attack you and make whatever happens to be a catastrophe, to be dirty, to be dark, to be evil. This is two brothers. The first murder. Killing one another over some jealousy and over the fact that they did not understand or was willing, Cain was not willing to be obedient to God. Let's talk about it. So, Abel was the second son of Adam and Eve. His name, Hebel, in the Hebrew means weakness, vanity, or vapor. It, it means it's transitory. See, God always has names, and I said this before, our names, uh, when God names something as far as the action or as far as the destiny or the purpose to that person, especially in biblical times, the name spoke synonymous, synonymously with the character and with the purpose of our character. So this reflects 
uh, Dave Abel's quick death. He was only on the scene for a while. Are you with me? He was only on the scene for a moment. You can be powerful for God for just a moment. And he believed in following God because as we know, even though we're reading in Genesis, we started with Hebrews because we know Abel is mentioned because of his faith. By faith. Because of all the other things that was around him, Cain had the same opportunity because of all the things that were around. Adam and Eve sat down, told both of them about the Lord, told both of them how they fell, told both of them if they served God to be blessed. Cain decided not to do it. He relied on himself. And Abel said, I'm going to follow God. And when we look at the lessons that happened from their lives, we'll find out that as a shepherd, uh, Abel was a shepherd and his brother tilled the soul. Abel, Abel followed through on the teachings of his mother and father. But in summary, even though they two were trained properly to worship God, one decided to follow God and one didn't. My question to you is, we never have to work for our salvation, but please don't work against the promises. Whenever you're disobedient, whenever you let your flesh take over, whenever you're sitting there allowing what words the enemy places in your mind and you take them as yours when you don't guard your mind, then you find yourself working against the promise. It's crazy. On one hand, you're believing and asking God for the promise, and on the other hand, you don't even know what the promise is. So if what we just read tells us that Cain is in this story because he was sinful. Now, to highlight the faith of Abel, let's look what the Bible says specifically about the sin of Cain. So if we look up at verse 4, we see the sin of Cain, it starts with verse 5 with a conjunction. But Cain, look at it. But Cain, but on Cain and his offering, the Lord, well, let me, let me, let me go. Yes, the one I want to go to. But let's go up. We found out what they did. Let's stay with that verse. They both took an offering to the Lord. Cain decided to bring God fruits, vegetables, whatever he thought was the, you know, the prize of his crops. Abel bought God what Adam and Eve said the Lord wanted. God had to tell them by worship, by the fact that God accepted one's worship and accepted the not. We're going to look at that principle. But Cain and his offering, the Lord did not look on with favor. Wow. So Cain was very angry and his face downcast. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? So Cain did not know how to handle his life, except we write these three words down, anger, weakness, disappointment. Anger, weakness. I was telling somebody today, isn't it something how quickly we can get anger, angry, and desecrate not only our own bodies, which are temples of God, but desecrate God's name through our actions. We're the ones who represent God, but will scream and cuss and holler, have fits, then come down and act like it did not hurt our relationship or promises of God. And sometimes we'll get to the fact where we want to still be angrier even more. So we found out they both knew how to worship. God told them what to bring. Cain decided he was not going to do that. Cain was that child who was of the seed of the devil. You say, Pastor, how can you say Cain was of the devil? Follow me, Bible scholars, because it said that the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, as soon as you're not serving God, you're serving Satan. I know you got a big title, and I know you got a name, and I know you've been saved, but as soon as you allow your flesh to take over and guide your reactions, then you're now earthy. Like Cain, you're now fleshly like Cain. You're at the point where you can't handle disappointments. You develop jealousies of other people. You are envious of other people. Every mean trait you can look up when it talks about um, the fruit of the spirit and the fruit of the flesh. If you go to that list in Galatians, you'll find out, man, what is this flesh capable of? And if you were to be honest tonight, 
I want you just for a minute. I know it's going to shake you, but if you were to be honest tonight, you and me, be honest right now, haven't we done some raunchy stuff through this flesh? You don't have to say anything. You know, I, I, you, you see me, but I'm just telling you, know, I, when I look back sometimes on the stuff that I've done in my flesh, you know, we can sugarcoat it and you can tell me this one did this or something. But the bottom line is, you make that decision. That's why it's always talking about my faith. Because our flesh is so prone to evil, because our flesh is so prone to weakness, because our flesh is prone to the deceit of the devil, that I never can get my victory because I let that weakness, I let that deceit, I let that, that fleshliness get hold of me. Now it's time for me to stand. I just found out I got cancer. I just found out my child is failing. I just found out that I, I can't keep thoughts in my mind. I found out that I got, I'm staying up all night. I can't sleep. I'm finding out that the pressure is mentally on me. Uh, is making my life miserable. I'm finding out that I'm living in fear and anxiety. I'm living with all kinds of stuff. And yet I go to church and praise God and hallelujah and sing, you know, no weapon and sing that. Break every chain. We just start singing all of those songs. But do we make a decision how? By faith. Listen to me. Put your faith in action. Your flesh is not going to like it. Put your faith in action. Your flesh is going to want to do what it wants. But you can't have it both ways. You can't please your flesh and then walk in supernatural power. Cannot do it. And if sometimes the fleshly part is so much easier. It, it feels so much better. I feel good when I'm mad at you and I can tell everybody how bad you are and scandalize your name and let them know this is what you did and I don't like you and they shouldn't like you. And then we sit around and wonder, where is my blessing? Your blessing came because when your moment that you got to stand, all of us are going to have moments to stand. You can't stand except by faith. So we find out that it looks like Cain followed in Adam's footsteps. You know, he followed in Adam's footsteps as a worker on the ground. That's what Adam was. But Cain, when he faced the disappointments, he didn't answer by faith. He answered by his feelings. Feelings will kill you. I was talking to someone today about, you ever had a phone call? I've done this, and God has blessed me. Hallelujah. He saved me from it. But you ever been talking on the phone to somebody, and then you hung the phone up, but it wasn't all the way hung up? Oh, my God. And I remember this one time, the person, and believe, it, believe, believe this, people will listen. If they don't know, you don't know, they have not hung up, and that phone is not down, I'm giving you some pointers. Check it, because sometimes we can say stuff that even though it doesn't sound mean to us, when you pull all the wrappers off of it and the other person heard it, you know in your heart and mind you wouldn't want them to hear what you're saying. And you can be saying for whatever reason, you know, I'm just telling the truth. Are you? But the things you're saying are mean and hurtful. And all of us, I got to clarify this statement because I said, somebody's going to say, I don't do this. All of us talk about people. Now, we may not be the Big backbiters, you know, you got one that you know you can't tell them nothing. They tell everything. But then all of us have found ourselves putting folk down. That's part of our sin nature. I got to tell you the truth. It, it's part, if you don't fight it, jealousy, envy, uh, whatever your motive is, maybe some hurts from your past, some situations that you're dealing with now that didn't go right, you don't understand why their life is so blessed and your life is not blessed, you can start sitting down, meditating on that mess, and it'll send your salvation into another direction, and all that you need to do, you can't do, which is answer by faith, because you've allowed your body to be polluted, infiltrated. So, I remember this one time, I didn't hang up the phone. It was nothing, thank God, but the grace of God, and my wife was talking to me. In my mind, after I hung up on this person, I had some negative and derogatory things to say about him. You know, you know how people are. You, you know, I wasn't really being mean, but I was just going to say, you know, uh, you know what I'm talking about, big head, liar, whatever you're going to say. But my wife kept talking about something else. Thank God for wives and many words. She kept talking about something else, and pretty soon the person on the other line said, <clears throat> and I said, oh my God, I realized God gave me favor at that moment. I know, I'm the only one that talk about people. No, 
all of us have to guard our tongue. We're the honest saints that'll say, man, I know I got to guard my tongue, I got to guard my words, I got to guard my mind, because if I don't, the actions that will come out will be the dark actions of what I think and what I'm doing. I got to hurt you. So, Cain found himself unable to handle his disappointments. Listen to me. Write this down. This is good. If you can't handle the disappointments, if you can't handle the dark times, if you can't handle being obedient when it's time to be obedient, if you can't handle the power of the word that says don't do this, do this, or don't do this, if you can't handle that, what makes you think you're going to stay sane when you have a struggle, when you have an attack? What makes you think you can handle, what, what makes you think you will still be sane when all of a sudden, at the moment you can't handle anything, you let your flesh take over, and now all of a sudden, you think you're going to flip a switch, and all of a sudden you're going to be able to handle, no, whatever we let dominate us, whether it be flesh or spirit, walk in the spirit, dominate us. Let's get to the principle. So we found out Cain had a choice, and he did not make the right choice, right? Cain could have done what he needed to do, but Cain allowed the sin to get so far until he committed murder. What are the lessons we get from Cain? So God said, Cain, if you do right, why are you so down? Why are you so down? Why is your spirit so down? Why is your spirit so down? Why? I'm not talking to Cain now, I'm talking to you. Why is your spirit so down? Why do you let your spirit get down? Because you need to know all of these things I've been talking about, you let them drive you and you meditate on them. Cain, here's what happens when you don't control it. You go to principles. Cain's spirit was so bad, even after God said, I'm going to give you another chance. He said, if you do right, you know the blessing will come. God told Cain, why are you so down? If you do right, the blessing will come. You're sitting there hoping God will overlook and overlook and overlook. And God is saying, no, ma'am, no, sir, no, bro. You got to do what's right. You have to get into the word and practice what you know. You can't sit around and just hope because of God's grace and God's mercy and God is just loving God that you can violate biblical principles and you won't get the consequences of them. It doesn't work like that. We all found ourselves there. I can look back over my life and think of things that I've done that I believe really hindered my walk in God, my actions. Anybody else? Stuff I did that I said I would have been further if I could have just thought better and walked by faith. And Cain will let you know, his got all the way to the point of murder. First point you need to write down, God looks at the heart. The heart. Cain's heart. Spoke volumes. What 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 does the scripture say about the heart? People may look at us and they can't see what's really in our heart, but Jeremiah 17 10 said, I the Lord search the heart, test the mind, to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Look what God said. I know. You're still in church. I know you still say you serve me. I know people on the outside don't know, but I know you. How I many know that's a scary thing when you think about it? Everywhere I am, everything I do, I know God is there. But sometimes the anger can be so much that I even forget God is there and I give him no honor and no glory. So I really believe thinking about this. There are times when you're in church and the spirit of God really hits you and you're giving God all this glory and honor and God is saying, that will be good, but you got it. heart. What kind of heart? What kind of heart do you have in the sense that 
when you think about your secret thoughts, your think, secret inclinations, your secret desires, are they wrapped in darkness or in, in the only bright spot is when you intentionally are praising God? Well, what you have to do is learn how to control those moments and give God glory. And all of a sudden, the enemy has no control over you. Look at what the Word of God says about the heart. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. I like this. And desperately sick. Who can understand the heart? The heart will make you sick. Proverbs 4, 23 says, keep your heart. Write this down. With all diligence. For out of your heart flows the springs, the directions, the fulfillment of life. So I can be whatever I want to be on the outside. I'm talking about Cain. I'm talking about Cain and Abel. We're going to talk about the faith of Abel. But God threw Cain in there so we have this contrast and comparison. Cain had the same opportunity, but he didn't have the right heart. Maybe, just maybe, the reason you didn't get blessed and someone else got blessed that doesn't look as spiritual as you is because inside their heart has been cleaned up or under control more than yours had with the secret areas that's in your heart. We got to clean it up. The second thing we find out is righteousness does not always lead to a good life. So what do you mean by that? Well, we found out that Cain killed Abel. Abel was the one doing what God said, and yet, Abel died. Look at, at verse 4 of 11. Look at the Bible. says, And by faith, the act of faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice than Cain. It was what he believed, not what he brought, that made the difference. Follow this. He believed God was good. He believed I need to be obedient to this benevolent God. He believed God is my all in all. He believed. When he believed these things, he acted on these things, and yet he died. Cain rose up and slew his brother. Living a righteous and faithful life, don't let anybody fool you, no matter what they tell you, doesn't always lead to a, a, a protection in life that you don't have to go through anything. I, I count it like this. I believe the only validation, oh man, I hate to say this. I believe the only validation that I've grown and the only validation that I have faith is how I act when I'm in the middle of something that's crushing me. How do I act when I'm in the middle of something that I'm very anxious and I have no patience and I, how do I act in the middle of something that's very fearful to me? That's the only way God can tell me that I am righteous or in right standing with him because there's some growth that's taking place and the thing that is holding me now shouldn't be quite as scary when I'm looking, you know, it's quite as scary now because I've gone through some things. Always liking it to when I was a, a, a child, I believed in monsters. And I know I'm not the only one that believed in monsters, but I remember... Uh, I, I watch all the monsters. I watch every horror show. I don't do that stuff now, but I I love watching you know, all the vampires and it, and I watch all the Wolfman. I watch all, oh, anything I can find. Watch The Exorcist when I was growing up, and then scared to death when I go to bed. Watch all the best. I, I, I watch people now when they go and watch all the scary stuff, knowing that the devil is just they playing into the hands of the enemy because they haven't gotten their faith strong enough that they can handle it. Uh, I remember one scene from the Exodus, Exorcist when, um, I said the Exodus, Exorcist, you know, a little girl. And I remember in that scene when the, the priest was standing there with his collar on, he was sprinkling the holy water, and he said, show yourself, show yourself, show yourself. And we're sitting there watching, and the demons turn the girl's head around. Then the girl looks up and says, show yourself, and the demon says, in time. And he said, show yourself. We're sitting there. Show yourself. And the demon said, in time. Man, I wanted to jump out the movie theater. I wanted to leave because I let that fear of the demonic get into my heart. You may be laughing, but when you expose yourself and you don't protect yourself on what you're exposing yourself to, it can mess you up. But I remember when I was younger, I used to think that the monster could get me. I'm a grown man now. And as you grow up, that's why the Bible said when you're a child, think like a child, you become a man, there should be some things you've outgrown. 
That's right. I can stop the Bible study right there. There should be some things you have outgrown. There should be some things that no longer, you don't even believe them any longer. Our mind is so strong that what we believe is how we will behave. Watch this. That's why Cain, even though he might have saw the beauty of, uh, uh, the, I mean, Abel saw the beauty of Cain's fruit, he knew what God said to bring, and he brought what God said. But it led to the blessing of you growing stronger. Matthew 23, 35. Listen to this verse, Matthew 23, 35. So that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Zechariah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. What God is saying is that the person who does the evil is going to walk around. Maybe it don't happen now. Don't you ever think an evil person is getting away with it. I'm righteous. I may have to bear up under it. But if I grow and I stay in the word, it won't have any effect on me. Because I'll keep moving to the word. Now, when I say it won't have effect, I'm saying it won't get to the point where I won't use my faith. But the evil person who continues to walk in evil, saved or unsaved, you continue to walk in evil, sooner or later, that evil consequence is going to crash down on you, like with all the blood, the guilt from it. And what they were trying to say is, the beginning of life, when, when the first murder was taken, when you live that kind of life, where you are not obedient, where you don't understand following God's word, where you let your disappointments and your anger drive you, you'll never get to the point where you can exercise your faith. Listen, how do we know that? Jesus lived the perfect life, right? But he suffered. I can name you Noah. He lived a perfect life, but once he found God, once he got back, and you ever read the whole story of Noah, my Bible readers know what I'm talking about, he suffered. Joseph loved God. He suffered. Stephen, stoned. He suffered. Paul, suffered. John, suffered. Peter, suffered. James, listen. But the suffering I'm bringing to your remembrance because we remember their faith acts. Stephen was being stoned. I don't know if you mean, you know what that means to be stoned. But he said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Don't lay this charge. That's what he basically said. Don't lay this sin to their charge. As he was being stoned, he looked up to heaven and he got relief from God. We look at everybody. Peter, we look at, we look at all the folk who had faithful experiences. They suffered. I'm only saying this to you is because I don't want you to leave with the mistaken impression that if you put your faith into action, you live by faith, that... Um, Everything's going to come out all right. No. Righteous are going to suffer, but if they live by faith, they'll be blessed. So the first principle we need to learn is God looks in the heart. Second principle is just because you're righteous, if you're going to stand in your faith, know that i got to stand through my suffering. And the next thing is faith comes by action. The Bible teaches us, Abel teaches us, that he was blessed because of his actions. I always tell people, it's not, it's what you believe, not what you bring. Let's say it again. If you believe God is good, you will bring what is good. But if you just want to bring what is good based on your standards, then that means that you're not believing correctly, so you can't tap into God. You know what I'm saying? You, you, feel, you feel like God did you wrong because all you think about is those you know, three or four times when you shouted, three or four times when you lived right, five or six, seven or eight times when you were doing what was right. That's all you think about. But what about all those moments when you have the other thoughts and when you're doing the other stuff and you want God just to wink at it and yet you'll be mad at God because I didn't put my faith in action. God is saying a faithful person who wants to have, uh, I always call them encounters with God. you got to practice this. Can I teach you something practical? While you're in the middle of your tears, practice your praise. While, while you're in the middle of of the fear, practice not just reciting scriptures when you're scared. Recite the scriptures always so that then when you are scared, you have scriptures you can recite. But you have to learn how to do this by faith. Faith takes action. It's never going to be pretty. It's never going to be a time when you can just walk around and think that when I put my faith together, 
it's going to be okay. No. When Jesus healed the man of palsy in Luke chapter 5, verse 24, Luke 5, 24 says, but that you may know, is what he said to the man, the Son of Man had power upon the earth to forgive sins. He said to describe the Pharisees that were around watching the miracle. I say unto you, talking to the man of palsy, take up your couch and walk to your house. You shouldn't be shocked that Jesus can heal a cripple. You should be shocked that the cripple had enough faith to accept his healing. I believe you know Jesus can heal. I believe you know Jesus can help. I believe you know Jesus can help the situation. But you're, you need to be shocked because if you're going to act by faith, it takes action. Able produced an action. Everybody who got blessed by God had to move with action. The man who was in infirmity for 38 years, he had to receive the blessing. Get up and walk. You know, uh, outside the gate, beautiful. Paul up here, and John said, silver and gold we don't have, but such as we have, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. He still had to get up. Some of you want God to do the getting up, the blessing, the healing, everything, and God is saying, no, faith takes action. Not actions when everything is well, actions when everything else. Somebody listen to me right now. Come on, you're getting blessed because God is telling you, act now, not by what you feel, not by what's going on, not by what you think, act by what you believe. If you believe I'm Jehovah Jireh, if you believe that I am El Shaddai, if you believe I'm this God of all power, then act like it. Talk like it. Speak around your house like it. Speak to other people like that's what I believe. Talk to yourself, that's what I believe. Speak to your illnesses, speak to your infirmities, that's what I believe. And when you do this, God now can work in your life. Remember, the nobleman that came to Jesus and he didn't want Jesus to come to his house, but Jesus said, go your way, your son is... And he believed what Jesus said. He acted on faith. Blind man, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Ten lepers, go show yourself to breathe. Every time, <laughs> I hope you've seen this, woman with the issue of blood. When you turn around, go your way and sin no more. Every time there is an act of miracle, it takes faith. Somebody say, takes faith. Right in the chat, you got to act in faith. It's not acting on your circumstances, you got to act in faith. So we know we got to act in faith. The third thing, principle we learn, we must worship God on his terms. Wow. In Matthew 7, 21, 23, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in, in heaven. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. We can't worship God and think that we've done it well enough by judging our worship against how our brother and sister or how other believers worship. No, God has a different calling on our life. Our worship has to be based on who God, who we are at that moment and what God knows what we need. Remember the woman at the well when God told her, you must worship God in spirit, and he told her in truth. Think about how it's connected to the text. He asked the woman, you know what I'm talking about, the woman at the well, right, in John 4, 4, and, you know, Jesus talking to her, and, and he said, go call your husband, and she was truthful. She said, I don't have a husband. She said, that's right, you have five, and what you stand with now is not yours. What am I saying? Jesus said, you must serve me in spirit and truth. We got the spirit thing down. Man, you the best tongue talker, shouter, you got your moves to the left, moves to the right, you got all of that down, you're waving and your hallelujah, got that good hallelujah, hallelujah, you got that hallelujah sound. You, you just look so spiritual, you scare folk around you. But what about the truth part? Hmm, truth in the inward part. Do you, do you, do you face yourself um, lying? How do we get here? I remember one day, some of y'all say, I got to stop listening to this preacher. But I told a lie, and it bothered me. Not bothered me about getting caught. I had a conversation with God. God was saying, why did you say that? You know that wasn't the truth. And I remember wrestling with this thing. I said, well, God, God said, uh-uh, uh-uh. 
No excuses. No excuses. You got more excuses than a man caught in the bank with the money in his hand. A bank robber. No excuses. But we justify and let it slip. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. I'm now cognizant of the fact that that innocent lie wasn't innocent. That lie affects my blessing and my progress and my prosperity in my walk. Oh man, I got a million scriptures to show you that's true. Truth is important to God. And sometimes God will put us in a position where he demands the truth and it may be embarrassing, but he demands that truth. And so when God tells us to worship him, he said, come to me and worship me on my terms. In 1 Samuel 15, we know the story. Um, God told Saul to destroy everything. And Saul listened to the people, or it was in his heart. He let the king and some other people live, and he kept the best cattle. And when he tried to make excuses, you remember what he said? God said, I'd rather have obedience than sacrifice. Look at 22. Uh, Samuel walked up, the Lord has great... He said, the Lord has no delight, 1 Samuel 15, 22, in burnt offering and sacrifice. God don't care if you burn yourself out running around going to church. He don't care if you burn yourself out buying a whole bunch of church clothes, looking all, you know, all preacherly, all pastorly, all bishoply, all overseerly. I don't know if that's even a word. He don't care about any of that. What God cares about is, are you willing to sacrifice for me? And John 15, 14 says, if you love me, Jesus speaking, keep my commandments. There's many verses that we can look at where God is telling us that the principles of this text are the principles we have to live by. Let's look at what happened. Go back to Hebrews 11. Let's look at what the reward and the blessing that, that Abel received. Not Genesis, go to Hebrews. This thing is so easy to get wrong. And we wonder why our faith is not working. But there's some principles here. How we react and what we do can be that we can find ourselves acting like Cain instead of like Abel. So here it says, by faith, look at verse, look at verse um, 4. Abel brought God a better offering than Cain. But here comes the reward. By faith, he was commended as righteous. God said, now I know you've been there. Have you been some days where you felt like, I am in right standing with God today. I just blessed somebody. I read my scripture. I interacted with God's word. I put the word into action. I've been doing what I'm supposed to do. I did right by my wife and right by my job and my boss and my family. Man, I am in right standing with God. We know. How good it feels to know that I made some sacrifices for God. We forget that we don't do sacrifices like the Old Testament, you know, with bulls, the blood of bulls and goats and sheep, all this. God said, but my sacrifices are penitent heart, the upright spirit. It's somebody who says, Lord, I'm going to change up and direct my life straight to you. God said, you're righteous. When he spoke well of his offerings. By faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. He's speaking to us, saying, I was in the same situation as my brother. I heard the same word. I knew the same teachings. I knew what God wanted me to give him to worship. It would have been much better if I could have done my thing, but I decided to rein it in and do what God asked me to do. And so I knew that if I trusted God, I would get blessed beyond blessing. So we found out the principles. If you look at it, I want you to write these down. We're about to close. I need you to see this. This is what Abel has taught us about how to put our faith into action, right? The first thing we learn is God looks at the heart. God that's the tough one right there. We can stay on that one. 
The second thing we learned, not only does God look at the heart, we found out also that just because I'm righteous, it doesn't mean I'm going to have an easy time. But the inverted blessing of that is because I had a tough time, I get more righteous when I stand by faith. We found out that faith takes action. That no matter who got blessed, don't you think that their blessing just came arbitrarily or out of nowhere. No, most times blessings that we look at, these blessings must come from a place in our heart where we have cried and suffered and heard and read the scripture the way we should have read the scripture. And the last thing we learn is that God said, you must worship me on my terms. You want to see your life turn around tonight? Check your heart. Heart can be ugly. I have to guide my guard mine every day. Be honest with me. Somebody listen to me. I got to start guarding my heart. How do I guard my heart? I got to guard my mouth, my, my thoughts. My, keep your heart because out of it flows all of life. I got to remember when I'm into a situation where it doesn't look like God is fair, where it doesn't look like God can win, where it doesn't look like I have the energy. I got to keep stepping by faith because I realize that what I'm going through is never as strong as God. So I don't have to worry about how good I feel about walking by faith. I just got to make that sacrifice. Thirdly, I got to have some action. Faith takes action. I got to move. Do something. Turn your TV off. Open your Bible. Get on your knees and pray. Find you a secret closet. Start you a prayer wall. Start you walks in the morning where you talk to God before you do anything else for 10 minutes. Do something that takes your faith to another level. And then worship God on his terms. Sometimes I'm running around, running around, and you got to really decide that I do it God's way or my way. And is all of my running around, is it being guided by what God said to do? Mm -hmm.